LSA, many, many thanks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, wonderful. And Nina Barnett is turned into a, 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 a panelist. Oh, that's oh, yes. good, good, good. Good work. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um, so, guys, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Uh, we can hear you. Hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, we are still waiting on Kende and Sunday Deka. Yes, so we have, okay. Yeah, so we're waiting, waiting on, on two more. Kende, yep. How's everyone doing? Yeah, good. <laughs> 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 excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's been, it's been an uh, amazing time for the past two days. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, great paper so far also. Wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing this session. It's uh, no, many, no, no, many no. thanks. And welcome Absolutely. to everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all <laughs> and very much looking forward to your papers. Um, yes, thank you, like you to... for sharing and thank you, Vera, for organizing. Mm -hmm. And Tunde, Tunde, who's, and who's Tunde, organizing. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure. We have five <laughs> sessions, so it's really, it's been really exciting and uh, we're very much looking forward to, to continuing the discussion now. Um, who has not shared the test of screen sharing? You're very welcome to test sharing the screen before we start. Yes, please. Um, just, okay. Um, Jessica, you want to try first? Your screen, is it, is it okay? Okay. Um, has everybody tried the um, um, um Sunday, you want to check yours? Well, since um, um since Nina will be presenting first, um, do you want to check if you can share your screen? That would be great. Uh, Hold on. Yes, please. Mm. Okay. okay. That will work? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, then... Yael, you have Tunde's name. Are oh, you saw it already? Okay, let me change that again. Sorry, I don't know why. Oh, oh you... <laughs> he's uh, in his link. Unexpectedly, I did just leave. So I hope this is not going to happen again. I'm going to rename. I should be able to do that. There we go. Okay, okay. yeah, you're good. Should I try to share my screen? Yeah. Yeah, try it one more time. Hello. All right, this is probably not the right okay. thing. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And then Sorry. I'll try the slideshow. Okay, it's okay? Yes, very good. Okay. Great, perfect. 
and I will stop sharing. There we go. Um, Tunde, do you want to try us? Tunde, can you, can you hear me? Hello, Tunde. Maybe he's uh, Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> I can hear you now. Do you want to um, try, you can share your screen so we can solve all uh, these me, technical difficulties. Before let me, so. let me. Mm -hmm. Let me try them. Um, I think I'm not. Um, where do I do that again? I've forgotten that. Um, so you see, take your cursor to the bottom of the screen. You will see um, a green box with arrow pointing up, and there's an uh, inscription share screen there. So click on that green box with arrow and description share screen, then select your uh, folder or you know, part of your screen that you like to share. Okay. Do you want to try that now? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. Just in Let case we are going to start and you're unable to do that. Let's just see. Send are you seeing anything? anything? No, no, no. Not yet. Yet. Um, um, Dr. Babalala, do you think you want to send your email to him? Just oh, oh yes, yeah, yes, 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 you get coming up. Yes, perfect. All right, yes, yes, yes. 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 Can you can you click okay. on the slideshow? The slideshow, um, the top on the, the top, last, on the top panel. The last on the top, of, mm -hmm. last on the bottom. Yeah. Either way. Yes, excellent. You can do slideshow. Then and go then to the first, first on one the one left. One. From beginning, first on the left. From the beginning. No, um, beginning. no, 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 no. No, go back, go back. To slide, in? Go back to slideshow. No, no. Go, go back, back to slideshow. Slide now you see the then panel the on that one. exact. Yes. Awesome, you are there. Much. Okay. Um, I think we can start. Okay. All right. So you can, you can, you can, you can close your. Uh, Yes, screen now. Good, good, good. Do we have so Kenny? Thank you. Do we have Kenny. Some... No, oh, um, Kenny is not here yet. Um, let me see. Also, not on Honestly. the attendee list. So, um, um, can, can you? Just okay, arrive. yes, yes. Kenny is here now. Yeah. Larry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Um, well, we are going to start um. now. Honestly, because I don't I, want us I, to. Yes, I think we can. Honestly, I wish that um, I wish I can make a presentation. Um, objections. I've been down with malaria for some days now. Oh, whoa. but uh, but let me not. Let me not. Let me not. Um, let me just allow you to. Uh, yeah, um, I'm really not feeling fine, but uh, um, so you can go ahead. I, I'm going to reach oh, out to you um, uh, with the personal chat in a few, in few minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I welcome everyone to um, this um, panel, and I want Hello, to thank... Hello, the network is breaking here. And I want to thank um, um, Dr. Vera and Dr. Hello. Babalala for bringing every one of us together and for the past two days, we have had amazing times um, um, having wonderful discussions on the materiality of everyday life in Africa. So today we are going to start with um, Nina Barnett. Um, and I'm going to read Nina's um, bio before I uh, introduce her um, to, to give her talk. Nina Barnett is an artist and creative PhD student in the University of Johannesburg. Our most recent exhibition entitled The Weight in the Hair reflected on radioactivity and mine waste particulates in post-colonial atmospheric space. A creative practice uses drawings an immersive installation and experimental free filmmaking to engage 
questions of geography, infrastructure, materiality, and experimental knowledge. She is earned an MFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a BFA from the University of Witwatersrand. Her work has been exhibited and screened internationally, most notably in Chicago, New York, Bilbao, Bajin, Paris, and Johannesburg. I introduce to you Nina Barnett. Please take the floor. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, I've just gotten some noise outside my apartment, um, but I'm going to share my screen in the meantime. All right, are we all good there? Everyone can see? Yes, okay. So my talk today is called Johannesburg's Water, Intangible Heritage in a Post-Colonial Metropolis. Um, and uh, I'm starting with a, um, an image that comes kind of from the ridge that's in the middle of Johannesburg that I'll speak about. Um, okay, considering Johannesburg's water as heritage may seem like a tall order. Johannesburg is a rare example of a major metropolis built far from a river, lake or ocean. Though the ridge that stretches across the city from east to west is named the, the Witwatersrand, or White Water Ridge. The seasonal waterfalls that once um, left an impression on Dutch colonizers could not have sustained the city and has since been buried under concrete. While Johannesburg's origin story is most often told in relation to the geology of gold and its extraction, its history, its historical relationship to water provides a broader understanding of, colonial, of the colonial env mining environment from which the city grew and the post-colonial post city of today. This landlocked city formed in relation to a seam of gold rich ore that runs downwards diagonally under the city from east to west. The orientation of the seam suggests a previous topography and a sedimentary layer. Geologists theorized that the gold came to be there through alluvial deposits, transported and settling within prehistoric water. European interest in gold from 1886 onwards, prompted colonial investment and extraction. As Catherine Yusuf notes, geologic relations are always material relations of power. The capital and power-driven attitude framed colonial authorities' relationship to water from the start. Water was and is essential to the mining process. Ore must be processed and cleaned in water, and the remaining sludge must be washed away. This extractive mindset corresponds to Jamie Lipton's notion of modern water, which he describes as the presumption that any and all waters can be and should be considered apart from their social and ecological relations and reduced to an abstract quantity. In considering the water of Johannesburg as an abstract resource for mining above all, the reality of the location, landlocked and far from a reliable access to clean water, was superseded. Local streams, identified by early Dutch settlers as sprites, were quickly polluted. Mining companies responded in a capital-minded manner by purchasing tanks of drinkable water for employees. This established an economic relationship to the access of non to non-toxic water between Johannesburg citizens and the international companies invested in its mines. Isabel Hoffmeyer names this kind of relationship hydrocolonialism, in particular in terms of the colonialization of the idea of water, establishing water as a secular resource. Imported notions of progress promised by the mining industry and the belief in the wealth provided by the gold took precedence over the reality of, of a polluted earth and water, which has led to acid mine drainage among other environmental crises. A reliable source of drinkable water was established with the construction of the Vaal Dam. Uh, this is, our, this is a, a water tower in Johannesburg. This is the Vaal Dam, uh, which was completed in 1938, a venture funded by mining companies alongside government. To keep up with a growing extraction industry and the polluted water systems it produced, the apartheid government signed a treaty with neighboring Lesotho in 1986 building a vast network of tunnels between the nations that currently feeds water into the Vaal Dam via the Vaal River. 
The, term of, the terms of this agreement rely on an, an abundant supply of Lesotho's water and is clearly also an extractive minded and hydrocolonial process itself. This dynamic and setting allows for a particular post-colonial reading of water, one that is necessary as the environments and the water shifts in relation to climate change. In acknowledging water as an abstracted and politically as abstracted and politically produced in Johannesburg, it is possible to understand it as an example of hydrocolonial heritage. I propose that observing and relating to this water in terms of its materiality, and so considering water as a live presence or vibrant matter, both terms articulated by Jane Bennett, allows for an acknowledgement of water as active on its own terms. Johannesburg's water has indeed been abstracted, produced, polluted, and otherwise altered, but it meets these actions with its own behavior or misbehavior. It erupts through abandoned mine shafts. Uh, let me show you a picture of that. It's erupting through an abandoned mine shaft, bringing deeply buried heavy metals and acidifying, ooh, now I've lost my place. Mm and acidifying minerals to the surface, threatening the clean water supply. It erodes and leaks through the pipes that hold it under the streets, creating watery potholes. Seasonal streams overwhelm their concrete canals and flood the streets. In naming Johannesburg's water as an actant by Latour, and so thinking of this water as an affecting agent within its particular political, social, and environmental context, we can similarly understand that this water we can similarly understand this water within the context of heritage. To name water as heritage be unsettling because of its intangibility. It is matter that is prone to flowing, evaporating, dancing, and being present in different material forms, solid, liquid, and gas. Its borders are unfixed and fluctuating. At present in Johannesburg, we are in a dry winter, and I can feel the water leaving the surface of my skin searching for an equilibrium in the arid atmosphere. My eyes constantly blinking to hold back and maintain the moisture. Even the water contained in my body is not really mine. Karen Barad's notion of interaction conveys this fluidity. It unsettles the metaphysics of individualism, the belief that there are individually constituted agents or entities, as well as times and spaces. If water is understood as an actant, and also is defying the boundaries of individuality, what does this say about the possibility of it being, as Barad suggests, not a thing, but a doing, a congealing of agency? If I consider water as responsive and articulate and not, passive, and not a passive benign medium, my everyday interactions with it become charged and open to questioning. I move my fingers, pliable because of their water content, against the metal of my bathroom sink tap, twisting. A stream is released, pooling in the sink, splashing, leaking, exploring the surroundings to find a way to inhabit the new environment. I draw the water from my hand to my mouth. It tastes clean, though there's a lingering metallic flavor and a slight smell of bleach. The water becomes suspicious, hiding harmful particles, even as, as it appears to my moist eyes as pure and colorless. I sense this water, both recognizing it in my internal processes and making note of its journey to arrive in my sink and at my mouth, how it has behaved and misbehaved, what it, what it carries with it that is acknowledged, like the chlorine that is added to curb bacterial growth, and what is ignored possibly heavy metals, maybe acids, microplastics. Water in Johannesburg is considered safe to drink as pollutants are well diluted, but the toxins are still present, carrying the echoes of extraction, industry, earth, and even minerals from another nation. I am at the mercy of this water's doing. The existence of this water as an, element, as an elemental actant, moving, collecting, sedimenting, changing states is at odds with the regulated, volume-oriented, hydro-colonial system that has brought it to this unlikely city. To understand the water as responsive and interactive shifts the orientation away from the colonial towards a complex, risky way of knowing. Thank you. Ooh. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nina, for that, helping us to have an idea of the materiality of, of water itself. And I'm very sure that um, uh, the attendees will have um, um, some questions and um, comments um, after this. Okay, so why don't we go to the um, next presentation um, by uh, Yale Biro. Is it, is it Biro? Uh, uh, how, how do I pronounce it? Is, it, is that correct? Okay, thank you. It is. Uh, so I'm yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to read our, our short bio right now. Um, Yale Biro is an Africanist art historian and an independent curator and scholar. Our research focuses on African art, or African art history of collecting at the turn of the 20th century, its historical implications, and impact on development of the field. From 2010 to 2021, she was the curator of African Hearts at the Metropolitan Museum of Hearts in New York. Her 2010 PhD dissertation at Sorbonne received the dissertation prize of the Musée de Croix Branly Jacou Kirak, and her 2012 exhibition, African Hearts. New York and the Avagande received the 2012 Outstanding Exhibition Prize from the Association of American Museum Curators. Notable recent publications include the article, A Great Audacity of Taste, Aesthetic Judgment of African Sculpture at the Turn of the 20th Century. Also, the 2021 edited volume, Rhapsodic Objects, Heart, agency, and materiality, 1700 to 2000. And the single authored book, Fabricolic Regard, Marchands, Reserve at Object the Heart, Africans Lebo du Exodus 2018. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you to Vera and Tunde for organizing this, what must have been a tremendous amount of work of bringing all of us together. And thank you for sharing. Uh, so as a, as a former curator at the Metropolitan Museum, it's true that I, when I was um, asked if I could participate to this panel, I thought of presenting something on how the everyday is present in the art museum or not. Uh, where is the everyday in the art museum? By definition, the museum holds the exceptional rather than the, than the mundane. In terms of Africa's material culture of the everyday, its presence as well as its absences in museum context reflects on themes such as canon building, categorization, hierarchies between art, craft, artifacts, and a lot, raises a lot of questions. In her 2007 publication, Sydney Casphere problematized the, the fitting of, I quote, African artisanal practice into the larger discursive framework of museums and universities and other places. Sorry, I need to start my PowerPoint. I just started, I running, I started, I run with it. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Um, so Sidney Casper uh, problematized the fitting of Afri African artisanal practice into the larger discurs discursive framework of museums and universities and other places where people talk and write about art. So my short presentation today We'll just try to establish a historical framework to considering the reception his history of, of everyday material culture in these spaces. Sorry, not move my paper, I need too much noise. So I'm starting with this image from 1931, and I hope you will be able to see with a, a quote here, which I translate into English, and hopefully the profiles are not right over my little translation. Um, it, this is an instruction for collectors 
uh, of ethnographic objects dating to 1931, which was published and provided to colonial officers and, uh, and to everybody who was going to collect ethnographic objects in the field. And um, it's a fairly succinct document. And in one section, it is said, collect all the objects possible, ordinary or not. All objects are aesthetic to a certain degree. There is no real difference between the potter when he manufactures and the potter when he decorates. And this was very much the approach to collecting African works in an ethnographic context, in a colonial context during the first half of the 20th century. And I will come back to this document a little bit later. So already, of course, in the 19th century, individuals were collecting without having access to such guidelines. And um, interestingly, the approach to collecting was very much tied to personal interests. So this is even you know, before the imperial, the, the heavy imperial presence of the last quarter of the, of the 19th century with somebody here like Paul Soleil, who was, um, who traveled in what is uh, present day Senegal and Mali uh, around 1897, 18, sorry, 1878. And he had an eye for textile. He was interested in textile. He had worked amongst textile manufacturers in France before traveling in uh, Senegal and Sudan at the time. And he collected samples of textiles as well as, as full textiles. What is interesting about him in particular is that he donated his collection of textiles shortly after he came back in 1880 to, at the time, the Musée du Trocadéro in Paris, which was the newly created ethnographic museum in Paris. And that collection is almost one of the very first collection to have entered that institution, which means that little sample of textiles and cloth that he collected and purchased on the market, uh, in the marketplace in Senegal and Mali, um, were among the very first objects to enter that institution. Similarly, somebody like Charles Beving, who uh, was a British um, textile manufacturer, also collected a lot of textile samples and textiles, over 500 of which ended up entering at the British Museum in 1934, but he was collecting between 1900 and 1914. So this is another such samples. And um, so we are here in a place where commerce uh, was taking, was of course having a, a very prominent place in the collecting of things of every day, of these little sample of textiles. Um, and craft in that sense has a very specific place during the colonial period. Vicky Rovines uh, published an essay called Crafting Colonial Power, uh, in which she is pointing out to the importance of craft production as a recurrent target of colonial interest between praise, denigration, and also tentative of intervention. And she cites the craft historian Gled Adamson, who describes craft as a crucial prop in the theater of imperialism. So we have craft as a thing of commerce, of course, but also then being um, kind of taken on within the colonial context as a, a very central element to, um, to that theater of imperialism. So this interest, as I was saying, is reflected in the collections that are formed early on in the ethnographic museums. And another interesting individual is Franz de Zeltner, whom you see here and who published as early as 1910, these surveys of textiles technique that he saw and documented in the field, mostly in uh, here also Senegal and Mali. And his take on these textiles is uh, also really between admiration and denigration. And there is this constant pull and push around these objects and around this material uh, of craft, where even though he's documenting them very carefully, writing down the vocabulary that he encounters, 
um, at the same time, he can't refrain from stating at the end of this article that, um, of course, all these great things that he sees are only a consequence of the European and the French presence in the region, even though naturally this predated, uh, this, these are techniques and crafts that predated the, the arrival of the French. So everything started to be seen through the lens of colonialism. And here is one of these textiles that he collected that he also, um, as I was saying, documented them. And then he ended up bequesting them to the Trocadero in Paris in 1930. In 1930. Not only textiles is he looking at, but also jewelry. And so again, um, craft in all its form is something that enters into this theater of colonialism uh, very prominently with um, him writing this essay, which is actually published posthumously in 1934, which he wrote earlier on, and also with these little uh, jewel, jewels, a uh, ring and a uh, pendant, which you can see here as it is today in the collection of the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris. So all these objects are present in this institution. And this is the point I'm trying to make, that they entered early on, um, in large numbers, the Zeltner donated no less than 1,200 objects between textiles, jewelry, and also ceramic that he collected in the field. Um, Paul Soleil, it is uh, fewer than that. It's about 80 works. Child bathing, it's um, over 500 samples of textiles that he donates to the British Museum. But even though they are largely present in the collection, they are the stuff of storage. Um, very few of this material actually is displayed. And this is one of the points that I want to make is these absence and presences and the fact that they are there, but they are often not visible. And because it is the everyday and they don't necessarily make it into the forefront of, of the displays. Uh, I think that I was a little bit ambitious, so I'm just going to pass a few slides, sorry, just to make sure that I don't uh, go way over my time. So going back to that very first uh, slide that I showed with the, with the recommendation for ethnographing, ethnographic collecting from 1931, the individuals who wrote it were the student of the father of French ethnography, whose name is Marcel Mauss, and his recommendation was very much to collect everything, um, not to focus on the particularly exceptional, not to focus on any idea of purity and rarity, but on the contrary, to collect the plates that somebody would eat from, because in the end, these are works that are supposed to testify of an entire society. So it is with this in mind that the big collecting expedition of the 1930s in France uh, were proceeding. However, very quickly, a sense of aesthetic was kind of took over. So even his direct student, Marcel students, sorry, Marcel most direct students started applying an aesthetic filter that had largely been developing in the early 20th century in uh, Europe at that moment when um, works from Africa started to be seen in the Western context as works of art. They were being chewed in uh, by the, the reception of modernism, the history of modernism, the history of the avant-garde. These objects were completely dissociated from their original context, from the original framework within which they were seen and started to be interpreted as almost as modernist works of works of art with no specific histories. And so it is very much in this, with this background in mind that um, somebody like Denise Polm and Deborah Lifshitz who traveled in the 1930s in Mali started collecting work. So even though they were supposed to collect everything, they actually applied this aestheticizing filter and there is this letter that Denise Baum writes to Rivière, who was the director of the museum of the Trocadéro in Paris at that time, saying, we are bringing back to you a magnificent collection of 180 pieces, all selected with love. We are very proud of it. And there is a focus that starts to be applied on 
figuration and mostly on the, the, the human figure and also on some zoomorphic forms. And so here, one of the collections that they assembled, that Denise Paulman de Borrelifschitz assembled, are uh, a collection of um, door locks that are all figurative. So you can see a little door lock here at the center of this door. So here they collected the door, the door lock, and also the, the um, key to the, to the lock. So, and then on the right, it's a door lock uh, that has been stripped out of the door and doesn't have a key to it. But these are the types of works that they are starting to collect, really focusing on the form itself, trying to build a typology of these, of these door locks. And again, uh, focusing on their aesthetic appeal. Another um, outside of the door lock and this this um, focus on the figure on the human figure and the zoomorphic figure. Um, another typical example of such works that are started to be prized, even though they are objects of the everyday, but are really starting to make their operations in museum contexts uh, and are starting to be more visible are pedal pulleys. So this is very much an object of the everyday, but somehow through this process of them entering the museum setting and museum displays, they lose their everydayness and become again, disconnected from their original context. They're not seen as being part of a loom. They're seen position on a mount, for example, as you can see with the example on the left that is now in the Metropolitan Museum collection. Um, in 1963, there is an exhibition at the Museum of Primitive Art in New York that shows an entire display of such pedal pulleys. You can see them in the photograph on the right there. Um, what's interesting is that here, the installation designer did install them somehow hanging on these strings almost to allude to the idea of the loom, but it has become so abstract again uh, that they become something entirely different. They're no longer pedal pulleys. They are um, almost part of a modern art installation. So a watershed moment in the presentation of objects of the everyday in the US in particular, and in the museum world in general, are two exhibitions organized by Rossi, Roy Sieber, uh, first at the Museum of Modern Art in 1972 with African textiles and decorative arts. You have a cover of the kettle on the left, and then African furniture and household objects in 1980 uh, at the Indianapolis Museum of Art first, and then that traveled to the Brooklyn Museum. With these, so both exhibitions are organized by Roy Sieber. And these are shows that uh, anthropologist uh, Christopher Steiner has called cannon shakers. Um, because through these exhibitions, Roy Sieber really tried to put to the forefront works that were not seen or displayed in museums and art museums in particular. This is here, all these archives are actually, for, for everything that pertains to MoMA, they are available on the MoMA website, which is um, quite fantastic. And here, this is the press release for African textiles and decorative arts. And you can see here highlighted in red, the second where in the press release it is said, um, in this century, the West has come to understand and appreciate the power and beauty of African sculpture, but textiles, body ornaments, and jewelry have remained largely known to all but collectors and, museums cur and museum curators. So they're pointing out to the, to the canon breaking moments that are these exhibitions in displaying textiles, body ornaments, and jewelry. <clears throat> So here are some view of that exhibitions. You can see it's very much the 1970s uh, with these sorts of tubular cases where jewelry and um, also then textiles in this um, sort of serpentine trajectory that one can take across, across the display are, are featured. So one, one can question, are they really works of the everyday? Probably a lot of these are actually prestige objects. Um, and also the, the, the attention is very much on the 
exceptional in the sense that there is also yet another aesthetic criteria that is applied that is very much a western based aesthetic uh, filter that is applied on onto these works um, what is interesting is that in the catalog introduction Siebert does mention that he went through over 3,000 works in order to make his selection for that particular exhibition, and only focusing on American, on American collections, which means once again, that these works are very much present in collections, whether they're pri private collections or institutional collections. They're just not the things that were put to the forefront of the museum world. Another uh, canon shaking, element of that particular display is the presence of works from Southern Africa. And until then, the canon of African art in the West, the way it had been built at the beginning of the 20th century, was very much focusing on West and Central Africa. Um, and here, through that presentation of works, um, of non-canonical works in terms of their genre, they're also including works from Southern Africa. And this was one of the things that probably remained uh, until today as, as a, a real canon breaker. Um, this is now the second exhibition from the 19, from 1980. You, um, Am I too Yanni? long? I, I, so then I'll just, I'll just, just say a yes. word of conclusion. Next, next moment, yes. yes. Um, so despite all these shows, it is still, uh, they're still under, these types of work are still underwhelmingly underrepresented in museums and the market where they are not fetching high prices. And we are still far from, and I quote Chris Steiner to finish, from the dissolution of a particular form of art historical myth-making and the deliverance of this discipline from the enchant enchantment of canonical thought. And I will just finish with this uh, pretty powerful statement from Chris Steiner from 1996. Thank you. And I will oh, stop sharing. Thank, thank you so much for that. I'm very sure that there's going to be a lot of questions uh, from, from the attendees. Um, let's just go um, to the next person, um, Tsunde Deka. Uh, Tsunde Deka teaches history at Ocean State University, Oshobu, Nigeria. He is interested in the history of the poor and everyday people. He has just completed a book manuscript entitled Selfie, Everyday Agency in Everyday People in Colonial Lagos. Research funded by ACLS African Humanities Program. He has written several articles on colonial Lagos. Tunde Deka has been postdoctoral fellow and visiting scholar at the University of Ghana, University of Oxford, University of London, University of Cambridge, and the University of Birmingham. Tunde Deka, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, uh, first of all, I really want to thank Abidi. Um, thank you so much for organizing this panel. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, it's, it's a very good job you're doing. And I thank you very, very much. Alain uh, Raji, I thank you for accepting to chair this. I'm very grateful. Uh, thank all the panelists who are here. And uh, I could want to go on with, uh, with my side. Um, um, let me see. Um, um, Am I, am I on now? Hello? No. Am I no, on? We can see no, not screen. yet. Okay. Uh, I think of... Uh, uh, I think I've clicked something I'm not supposed to have clicked. <laughs> mm. are, are you, um, so just look at um, the green um, button at the bottom of okay. your... Um, I want so. to make sure I, um, yeah. It says share screen. 
Yeah, good. Is he on now? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this is titled Yahuze to Bank Alert, Youth Culture and the Personification of Wealth in Nigeria. Well, what, what I've actually been trying to do is to look at how, uh, how youths in Nigeria have, have been considering materiality over the years now, and the extent to which um, hip hop music gives us indication as how, you know, how this thinking has been going on. And um, that is uh, that is the current thing now in Nigeria. Recently, uh, Nigerians youths have actually been listening to music that are written and performed by Nigerians. I remember in the 1980s uh, when I was a child, uh, the songs we listened to were songs uh, by Dana Steve, by The Whispers, by Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Bob Marley. Now in Nigeria, youths hardly, youths hardly, uh, 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 they, 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 they hardly listen to American songs. As, 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 and this was not the case in the 1980s. There are so many um, uh, varieties of artists that are, one can count, they are countless. And uh, their influence is incredible in the, thought, in the thought processes of young people and um, even elderly people, you know, that is currently the vogue in Nigeria. There's uh, this particular song that is going on, uh, on going on by the, I think the song is titled Buga, and you can find the dance all over the place. And um, it was released sometime early this year. And it was the same, the same way the, the, the song Buga is making remakes. It was the same way the song, the two songs, we're going to consider also midways when they were released and continue to have implications on the way you'd, uh, you'd uh, think about wealth and about every day. But it's, it's a very good thing to have uh, um, songs listened to by Nigerians and written by Nigerians. But then what, what, what really is the problem? Um, you know, many of these young artists have been very influential so much that they have been growing a certain you know, thought process among many Nigerian youths. You know, earlier on, some of, the, some of those artists did some protest music you know, against the Nigerian state, against Nigerian leadership, against what is going on currently. But recently, you have a situation whereby you have so many songs around that portray the accumulation of wealth on the other and the flaunting of that wealth on the other on the other side, on one hand and the front of the world on the other. You know, but the problem again now is, see, when you portray wealth so, so flamboyantly, and you, you don't give an indication of how such wealth has gotten, you know, it, it creates a certain image in the mind that, okay, all like I need to do is just to make money and then not, not minding how I make the money. What matters is how I spend it and how I show it off to people. You know, if, if, if we look at, if we look at the song written by artists and performed by them, we we'll see that kind of trend that is ongoing. You know, that, that becomes a, re a real challenge. You know, especially the fact that, you know, people, young people are becoming desperate. So much desperate that uh, we hear stories and evidences that even young people are growing into rituals, Using girls, you know, kidnapping people, you know, luring on, on um, young girls into things that they, they were not aware of. And uh, I particularly witnessed one on a certain morning in Lagos where a particular girl was dropped off by a car, a few with young boys. And she was dropped off hurriedly. She was in underwear and in full, full glare of everyone, she couldn't, she, she, she did not, she could not. You know, gather herself. And so it was obvious that she was, she had something to do with the boys that dropped her off. You know, everybody already, people concluded that she was used. In Yoruba terminology, they use the amorti low, meaning that, you know, parts of her body had been traded off for something, something to make money. 
you know, and so the problem now is it, 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 it is a worrisome trend, even among older generation of Nigerians who are now fearful of the outcome of their children in the midst of such, such terrible times. Yeah, Hoosie and Bangalata, two, two songs that I decided to look at to see those indications. This particular song, Yahuze, was released in 2007. And uh, what, I, what I did was to look at the song, look at the dance steps, consider the, the hidden narratives behind the, the laughter, the, the spending of money in the showcase. And there are several terminologies there that shows that this, this song, is a forceful anthem of a generation of rules. You know, it, it shows, you, you see it clearly that this, this, this song actually reveals that some people had been caged, so to say, from you know, really expressing freedom on how to make money, you know, that they were to do so and that they were not, you know, unrestrictedly. It shows that they, you know, they could do something with their lives especially outside the environment that they thought is really hindering them from success in life. You know, the first statement in that song says, first thing na homa. You know, what, that's, that statement is significant because of the things that actually came before making that statement. He made a statement to show us that some, a, a very significant thing had happened long before that statement was made. And so now, what he wants to do is to show off the, the evidence that he had made money, that he had eventually captured, captured wealth, and he was, he was desperate to really show it off. You know? And you see so many terminologies, so many expressions to show that if, 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 you, if you look at that song on YouTube, you know, there's, there's, this, there's this statement that this, this guy made. He said, la, 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 la. If you look, look at his face, you see disdain for the society that actually, quote, and that actually restricted him from making money. Of course, that was not what he intended. But that was the message that one really passes across. It more really looks at the body language, you know. So that, that's... And for him to tell us that America Latipawu shows that he got, not only did he get money from a different time, but he's, he's, he's telling us that this environment is not good enough for him. And that is, he does not like it and he will continue to be, get that kind of quote unquote support from that kind of client. You know? And so this song, remains this dainful Nigerian society. And uh, in fact, in, in, the, in just before, just before I, 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 I presented this, I was looking at a comment on, on YouTube and uh, somebody just wrote there that uh, he never knew that, that this song was about stunning people, that he got to know the true meaning of the song after 13 years, that it was all about scam and it was all about, was all about fraud. And so I'm still doing that. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a story that is ongoing. So I'm still looking at the thing and uh, I'll, really, I'll really, I'll be happy um, with comments. The next song is, yeah, uh, the next song is actually Bankalat. And uh, here is the, the same way, you know, it's, yeah, I, I use the two songs to show you some, some sort of very, some sort of chronological sequence in the life of, of uh, youths, whereby the, the first thing was to do quote unquote Yahoo and then to have an alert in your account. You know, the, the first statement the boy made in this bank alert by P Square um, was he said, One year I'll be back, one year. It took him five years to return, but in that five years, he had accumulated well so much that he was able to get a gold string, he was able to buy a brand new car for the girl, he was able to to arrange the whole community, you know? The problem is that no one in that, fine, we can say that the, 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 the four minute song could not, the narrative of the four minute song could not really accommodate the questioning of the young man's wealth by either the, the mother or the father of the girl or by even the community. In ancient times, some people, people will have gone around to find out how really he got that money from. You know, or could there no, not have been gossips as to, let, let, 
we are we are assuming that they could not the song could not accommodate that. But then it Thank gives you. us an impression you, that money is washed. Wrap, uh, that there's can you wrap up, please? Do that. Can you wrap up on so that? we have that, and then, well, I have, I have this. Um, uh, I was able to interview some, 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 some boys, and um, the, the, those are their term, Those are their terms: gaming, hustle, rites of passage, babalawos and pastors, zero in the accounts, things like that. You know, what, what they what, what one of them actually was very frustrated that his consultation with babalaos and pastors did not did not did not, did not get him anywhere. Eventually, he became he became worried, left the trade, and went to stay with a, a family. And in fact, till today, he's almost running mad. So you have these terminologies, and you have the other half coin, which we, well, by that I mean their relationship with girls and the, those. Those statements you see there are the statements made by girls to boys, so that the boys will become desperate to make sure that they they actually they respond to their requests. You know, so the guy I, I described the grain, the different categories of of scamming, you know, of uh, pretense and what have you. And then you have a situation whereby it, they can be easily identified. Use with that can be said with all those items. And in fact, you see, it is it's something that remains ongoing, it remains updated on a daily basis. The desperation is tied to political economy. The, the skills are transferred and operation it continues to expand. Uh, welcome comments. It's still an ongoing project. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. That was um, really uh, fascinating. I'm very sure um, there's going to be a lot of questions. And I also have some um, um, by myself. Well, I'm um, taking a cue from this youth culture that has just been delivered by Tunde Decker. Let's go to uh, um, Kendi um, Samuel Olukayode, who is also going to delve into a different aspect of, of youth culture. So Kendi uh, is a graduate of the Department of English University of Lagos, Nigeria. He holds a master's degree from the same department. His research interests are theater and performance popular culture, cultural studies, and material uh, media studies. Some of his papers have been published or are awaiting publication in repeated journals. Please take the floor. OK, thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, I would like to share my slide immediately. OK. Uh, so uh, can you see my slide, please? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the title of the title of my presentation is showing a scene, understanding the maturity of the Nigerian youth culture, and with no doubt the, the the Nigerian youth culture is an evolving culture and it's becoming becoming relevant. And since the NSAT protests and the president and the president's comment that Nigerian youth are lazy, there has been a very there has been a lot of a lot of works coming out to this either to refute that assertion or uh, uh, support that assertion. Now, uh, sorry, moving on to the next slide. Okay. So um, this presentation is, I, 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 um, my presentation is broken down into several uh, sections. Uh, I have the introduction, data, methodology, and um, yes. Um, I've given the introduction that uh, one, one thing that, that comes to play in the question of my study of maturity is that there is a simultaneous relationship between the subject and the object. And I use the expression showing the scene because that actually captures that relationship uh, 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 aptly. And I, I, I understand that no, no, no object exists in a vacuum is either a reaction or a contribution or a, 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 a continuation of, it, of an existing discussion. However, this, this, this research is an ongoing research. So um, methodology, as in, this is a descriptive interpretive research that is focused on music videos, paintings, comical skits, and depicted by Nigerian youth. And all these data, uh, uh, the comical skits and the media videos are drawn from YouTube, while the paintings are collected directly from the playwrights. 
uh, from the uh, painter, the artist himself. But for the purpose of this, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus mainly on paintings, and that's paintings of Tuju Clark. Uh, this study adopts an ethnographic research method. The study is qualitative, and during field trips, there were interviews with the uh, comical skits uh, uh, producers and even the painter itself. And they were all part of it. And, and this study is anchored on the theoretical notion of representation, trying to use materiality as a concept to, to understand the aesthetics and the semiotics that exist in the works of Shoju Clark. Um, I'll take it to the next slide. Uh, what is material culture? Material culture in this research is understood to be uh, the relics or the epitome of a particular group of people within or without that culture, as long it, as it, it represents that, that group of people or speaks to the experience of that group of people. And the material culture cut across several disciplines. And like I said in the slide, it's on discipline and rather discipline. So um, materiality, materiality speaks to the philosophical and theoretical manifestation of a particular group of material culture. Um, um, so let's go straight to the data uh, that I have and uh, that I'm presenting. That's Toju Clark's painting. Toju Clark is a, is, a, is a visual artist based in Lagos, Nigeria. His work examines the mood and mental state through paintings of human boss. Uh, he's one of the only um, ex graffito. Uh, 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 method it uses the S Gravito method of painting. And what S Gravito means is using needle to scratch out images out in, in, in paintings. And that's very interesting. Um, this, this is one of his works. The first book here is Split Thoughts. And, and that also exemplifies the Nigerian youth who have split thoughts about their dreams, about their, uh, 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 about their experience, their aspiration. And we we'll see three faces here over there, just you know, trying to depict the split thoughts that 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 they experience. Um, we have mood swing and the character in this. Can you see my slide? Yes, we the can. character, yes. the character, yeah. The character in this in this painting is to, is Toju Clark himself having a mood swing and he's trying to express this in several in, in, in several uh, character motifs as we see that revolving there we see a picture of him sad smiling and all that and that also expresses the 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 experience of the nigerian youth always you know we have someone who take for example a nigerian youth who is having mood swings as a result of several needs or meds or as a result of a, 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 a terrible situation is going through uh, we have worrying thoughts. Uh, worrying thoughts is one of my, one interesting painting that caught my attention. Where you have it, it actually the big Nigerian youth who is having worrying thoughts. Worrying thoughts about will my dreams be fulfilled? Will I achieve? Will this continually be my experience? I want to. I want to travel out of the country. I want to leave this place. And all those are are the experience are the worrying thoughts that colors the mind. Of, of the Nigerian youth. Then we have the watchers. The watchers. I, I, I feel this offers a very, a very a multiple layers of a polemic interpretation. Watchers could be the society itself, mother, father, parents that are expecting. And to, to, to also to, to make a reference to, to uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, presenter in his life, we see that some of, some of these young guys who go into this uh, uh, fraudulent art are motivated or are, are cajoled to go into this as a result of their mothers, mother, 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 uh, mothers pushing them, girlfriends, and etc. And so those 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 people, those individuals, serve as the watchers, watching and expecting something. Then we have clouded minds as a result of this whole aspiration, desires, wanting to fulfill. We have he has a clouded mind. He does he's, he's saying he's uncertain. As to, as to what he wants to do, as to how he wants to go, as to, you know, everything that, that surrounds his existence and his apprehension of his, apprehension of his, of, of his society. So that is, that is, that, 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 that these paintings, Toji Clark's paintings actually, actually encapsulate 
the experience of the Nigerian youth. I, 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 we all know that through various forms of popular, uh, popular um, genres of popular culture, uh, popular culture, Nigerian youth have tried one time, always, always again, to express their bitterness against the the the, the setback they experience in, 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 in their country. So, and, and at the end of the day, it results into bipolar. I, 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 I've forgotten where I got the, the statistics, but right now, as the statistics shows that we have more youth trooping into therapy, into, into depression, going into therapy, going for therapy and all that. And, and that, that, that also is, is a whole lot, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot that, that, that the, the bipolar syndrome, depression of the Nigerian youth as a result of failed dreams, unfulfilled dreams, uh, the government not coming forth, even the, the, the entire experience is, is, is an experience that can lure any individual, any individual who, have been, who has been victim of the police brutality, which has not been, which, which has not been an, a, 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 very, a, very, a, very, a very wonderful experience. So, you know, what, what, what is Tony Clark telling us? Tony Clark is telling us that, see, that the Nigerian youth have emotions and have emotional states and and it is, it is this emotional state and mental state that he tries to depict in his work and we also see that this also resonates this ideology of protest also resonates into comical skits um the comical skits we studied in for this that, that we studied for this uh, that we that we undertaken for this study is the skit of mc lively we we'll see that the earliest um, skits of MC Lively was just based on the concept of Agidi, the Uba word Agidi that is being stubborn, and that and and you will thank see you him coming so out much. to to Can okay. you okay oh. yes thank you thank you okay so to wrap up we will see that Nigerian youth are speaking up and in 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 the Yoruba term are are practicing what is known as Sorosuke and that the, the youth culture is betting what is known as the Sorosuke generation. Um, thank you very much. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. It's interesting to see another dimension of the experience of Nigerian youth, um, just as we had in the previous um, talk on songs, and now we have one through painting that's exhilarating. Thank you so much, Kendi. Um, So our last speaker for today is Dr. Rufa. Um, she is an assistant professor of history at Ball State University in Indiana. She joined Ball State in fall of 2016 after completing her PhD in African history at Emory University. She specializes in the history of West Africa and the Atlantic world, gender and sexuality, and colonial law. She is currently finishing her first book manuscript, Fostering Trust, a history of girl girlhood and social motherhood in West Africa. I'm going to stop here because it's a lot of interesting uh, uh, um, bio she's got there. Thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Jessica. Please take the floor. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, just let me, oops, get situated here. If I can. Uh, Okay. So as you can tell from the slide, my presentation today is on uh, visual material culture. Um, I'm a specialist, particularly in pre-colonial and colonial Dahomey. Um, so uh, that's what the focus will be on. You'll see if you look at the title in the actual uh, pamphlet, I had originally planned on doing a more comparative paper, but uh, time commitments have made it very much focused on just a few images. So I'm gonna give you a close analysis of two images. So the American Historical Review recently published a round table discussing the edited volume, Ambivalent, Photography and Visibility in African History. This presentation builds upon the contributing scholars engagement 
with how photography can be used to examine the material realities of Africans' lived experiences in ways that challenge narratives based in European authored written documents preserved in archives in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Photographs have the potential to read these historic documents anew in ways that privilege and empathize with Africans' points of view. As the Beninese historian Luke Garcia astutely observed, all the European men who visited the slave coast region during the Atlantic era and the colonial administrators stationed in Dahomey uh, produced a quote, as he said, an excess of riches, end quote, of source material on the peoples of the region. Yet this wealth paradoxically masked its shortcomings in its bounty. These men produced a superabundance of words about the kingdom and then the colony of Dahomey, focusing on the political history of the region, the king and his palaces, cultural exchanges, and exotic ritual practices. This profusion of words also generated myopias that left certain topics obscured because of the limited fragments preserved on these subjects, such as girls' lives. This paper's key question is, what information do images from Slave Coast markets refract beyond the contents of the image itself to assist us in overcoming these documentary myopias that Dr. Garcia pointed out? In the round table, Marius Cother um, pointed out Images are more than mere illustrations when analyzed in conjunction with oral and written data. So let's turn to a specific image to see what these theoretical and methodological insights potentially yield Andy, about lived experiences. So as you can hopefully see on the slide, um, this is an image uh, captured by Alexandre Delbecca and it's called, quote, Market of Grand Popo. In this image, girls sat next to their wares in the market and prepared themselves to negotiate with interested parties. Other girls, like the girl in the center foreground and the two girls behind her to the left, stand with their goods balanced atop their heads. The loads the girls balanced weighed as much as 20 pounds. Um, and so these girls' postures of thrusting their pelvises forward holding their lower backs or reaching up to steady their loads indicated the tremendous labor and skill involved in the activity of hawking goods in the market. A very much everyday West African scene I'm sure everyone is familiar with to this day. Um, this is, you know, hawking goods in the streets was a physically exhausting and at times this is what knowledge can be gained from a deep historically informed example and as I've alluded, this is not surprising to perhaps anyone here, but too often history really relegates these everyday experiences and doesn't really shine a light upon them. These observations about the taxing nature of Hawking drawn from the visible embodied evidence of the girls' postures remained absent in the written record. Illustration is important in these market scenes but still more can be gleaned. So now let's shift our view and dig into what is beyond this rich descriptive level of analysis. In a second 1895 image, also based on the photographs of Alexandra Dabeka, um, and also situated in Grand Popo, which is a city, was a city in the French colony of Dahomey, and it's, um, in the modern day Republic of Benin. In this image, we see a West African girl wrapped from her bosom to her knees in an embellished panya, a swath of cloth about two and a half meters in length and a meter and a half in width, approaching a market woman reclined on her left hip. Behind the woman's left shoulder, she displays her meticulously folded and arranged wares. The merchandise sits atop woven reed baskets under a shaded market stall. These goods indicate her profession, which is confirmed by the title of the image, Un Marchand de Tissu, or a fabric seller. 
A careful analysis of the many layers of complexity contained within this captured quotidian moment um, allows glimpses into the written and visual record, which allow for suggestive histories of girlhood. So through examining the material reality depicted in this image, the dynamics of the social hierarchy between the two females become evident. The fabric seller adorned her body with two banyas layered one on top of the other. Even in a grayscale image, the over banya almost gleams in the sunlight, which emphasizes its pristine cleanliness and the ornate bands of thin horizontal lines of the contrasting color. The market woman's conspicuously higher quality banya makes the girl's attire appear visibly inferior and almost dingy. Since at least the 15th century, Atlantic West African societies developed a well-cultivated taste in textiles. Women and men alike place great emphasis on cloth's power to communicate status. The woman accessorized her clothing with an elaborate hairstyle that further attested to her social position. The shaping of her tresses served the dual purpose of being aesthetically pleasing and communicating that she had achieved an ele elevated status within her household hierarchy that exempted her from carrying loads balanced atop her head. In striking contrast, the younger girl behind her wore a simple band of cloth around her head that could be coiled into a disc um, to protect her non-styled hair while carrying goods atop her head. So while aesthetically pleasing, the accessory served a pragmatic purpose that facilitated, facilitated her day-to-day -day activities of hawking goods in the streets and markets of Grand Popo or carrying water from a spring or river to her dwelling, two onerous tasks that took up significant amounts of teenage girls' time each day. The social connotations attached to these details shed light on the complexities of how female hierarchies operated within households. The image maker, Alexandra Delbecca, was a geography, geographer, explorer, and colonial administrator stationed in France's colonial possessions in West Africa from 1887 to 1894. He likely intended his original photograph to merely illustrate an everyday scene for his French audience, or perhaps it was meant to showcase an African quote type that he judged needed France's so-called quote civilizing mission end quote whether intentional or not though he also created a rich social document through the medium of photography which has the capacity to capture the visible as well as exceeding it the image and its accompanying text leave unanswered at least one critical question what was the relationship between the girl and the woman the evident in quality and statuses cast doubt on a multitude of possible familial relationships, such as biological mother and daughter, sisters, or even co-wives, where members of families would similarly, similarly try to display their status. More plausibly, the two were linked through some sort of servile association, such as mistress and slave girl or pawn girl female in a credit giving household. Existing historical and anthropo anthropological scholarship on African households has focused on two key and overlapping relationships, husband and wife, master and slave. Colonial attempts to make marriage legible and to abolish slavery resulted in rich, identifiable archives. Assuming though the girl to be a slave of the fabric seller is only the most obvious answer to the question of how to define their relationship. And jumping to this conclusion, precludes a serious engagement with African households in specific geographic and temporal context. And so looking at this image, what I argue is that in order to read Atlantic era and colonial documents from the 18th to 20th centuries, primarily authored by European and American men, to read them through West African ontological frameworks, it is necessary to set aside assumptions and contest familiar epistemological categories. Among these familiar concepts, which need to be problematized, are those that described hierarchical relationships within West African households. In order to develop an Afrocentric understanding of the complexity of this photograph as a social document more fully, 
and must be analyzed through the lens of Beninese collective memory. And collective memory, um, unlike oral tradition, has not been deliberately maintained in a fixed, albeit malleable form. This lack of formalization often causes it to be forgotten because it is such an everyday um, circumstance. Thank you. Uh, but I, I'm on my last sentence. <laughs> uh, members of societies along the Slave Coast region would have suggested at least one other possible option, entrusted girl and social mother. Um, and so this sheds new light on possibilities and um, helps transform what we're actually seeing through listening to um, oral data that says majority of pre-colonial children did not spend most of their lives within their natal families. Thank you. Um, I apologize for going slightly over. Uh, well, th th thank you so much. Uh, I want to appreciate all the um, panelists um, today um, taking us um, through the visuals in, uh, in, in the marketplace to um, our songs and, and paintings reflect the materiality of, of course, of the Nigerian youth itself and the experience um, as well as the question of everyday lives in um, in art objects. And then lastly, what we have now about the, the materiality of what on the one hand, and then the, the relationship of um, of gender, of course, uh, as um, Jessica just um, just gave to us. Um, so I'm going to open the floor for the for the audience to see what um, um, the, the questions basically um, for the panelists. I'm very sure there are a lot of questions and I also have some um, by myself. Okay, we have um Utito Fong Inyang um raising up the hand. I can I can I act um how you talk. Yeah, um, I think I've been unmuted. Hi. Oh, oh good, good, good. Uh, thank you very much for uh such wonderful, very insightful presentations. I have two brief questions and uh I think one is for uh Kende and the other one is for Jessica. So Kende, I, I found the uh, paintings that you uh, highlighted very interesting, especially the ones that spoke to aspects of emotion. So the watchers, clouded mind, bipolar. And I was wondering if you could speak more to what appears to be almost a, an intent to animate the subject, those photographs in very specific ways. So I'm thinking here about all these narratives about Nigerian youth, lazy Nigerian youth, too young to run, all these ideas of, you know, uh, infant infantilism, you know, they are not grown enough, they cannot participate, they don't have agency. But it seems that these photographs are doing something very specific in using embodied um, uh, forms of knowledge to speak, I was wondering if you could speak to that, the relationship between the narrative and how the photograph might be intervening in that. And then quickly, uh, uh, Jessica, I also found your reading very, very, very interesting. But the question that I had is uh, the point you made about reading uh, uh, these images through West African ontological frameworks. And I was wondering if you could speak more. Are there a certain that you have identified because more often than not, even when we have this um, desire to center stage African anthology in the reading of you know, uh, popular culture text, there is often more often than not the recourse back to Europe. So I was wondering whether there have been any of the kinds of ontological frameworks that you have identified. And also, how do we know in the two images in the picture, who is a girl and who is a woman? Is it just the material elements that help us frame that? How about if they are both of the same age, like how do we you know, uh, identify those kinds of very specific bodily uh, elements uh, that kind of guide your reading? But thank you very much. Sorry for the long elaborate question, but this was very interesting. <laughs> Okay, um, Jessica, you wanna respond? Sure, um, I'll answer. These are great questions um, for me. And um, I absolutely agree that, you know, trying to look at through an African ontology often falls into a trap that still becomes Eurocentric. Um, part of the larger project um, 
as was mentioned, this is part of a book project, um, is really to look at collective memory. And so the, um, the narrative I'm trying to find, promulgate, show, not just through images, but from um, the written records is things that appeared so self-evident to the Beninese, but were often silenced or overlooked in the archives. Um, so um, that was really, you know, the idea that most children were entrusted to households. They weren't slaves, they weren't um, biological children. So that was just, this image is just one way to start, as I said, writing suggestive histories to try and see all the possibilities. I'm not trying to say that was the only one, um, just that it's important to acknowledge that we can't limit to um, the ideas that have often overshadowed other options. Um, and yes, who is a girl and a woman is a, an incredibly complex subject that um, I do address in at least Dahomey or phone, phone culture. Um, you know, they have various different markers for that, but part of the um, part of status is, you know, part of an age designation of being a full adult woman would have had certain um, other things besides age. So age really isn't an important divider. So I know I haven't really given you a firm answer in either of those cases, but they're messy concepts. Um, so I will leave it at that so I don't uh, <laughs> dominate the time. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you, thank you for okay. that. Um, oh, yes, please. Oh, yes. Can, you make it, um, can you make it very brief? Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, and if I get your question right, your question surrounds why do these paintings matter? And also it's your question around the relationship that exists between the subject and the artist in question. Uh, I, I, during my interview with, with, um, with the artist and one effort he's, he tries to make is to see use his individuality as, 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 a, as a telescope to project what he feels or what he is experiencing and what he knows that other youth as he, other youth too would, ex, would, would be experiencing or be going through. So at the end of the day, we see that the idea of, the idea of rep, representation is not as um, lucid as we take it, as, 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 as we understand it to be but goes beyond to the representation of, of, of the idiosyncrasies that surrounds the Nigerian youth experience and how it reflects in the e everyday relationship between um, uh, the society and the Nigerian youth, quote and unquote. So, yep, I, I, I think that, 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 that's, that's my answer. I, I hope it's satisfying. Uh, yeah. Um... Thank you, thank you, thank you for the response. I will jump to uh, the chat box. There's a question here from Omoga D. Mikbule. It says, uh, great talk, Dr. Decker. I would like to ask, though, uh, what the relationship between the proliferation of afro breeds and the depopularization of Western music among the Nigerian youth is? Are there studies that explore this phenomenon? Uh, that's that's for you uh, um, um, today. Yes. Sorry, I didn't get that very well. Uh, 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 the, can, can you see the chat box? Can, can I okay. get that again? Let me, let me read it for you. It says, I would Is like it? to ask what the relationship between the proliferation of Afrobeats and the depopularization okay. of Western music among Nigerian youth is. Okay. Are there yeah. studies that mm -hmm. explore this phenomenon? One minute, please. Deep, deep. Okay. Thank you. I, I think, but really, I think um, um, it's not only Afrobeat, it's, uh, it's about uh, every other genre of, uh, of music in Nigeria. There's so much talent among the youths and um, um, that is being showed 
in, in, a, in, every, in every way, in the performances, in the, in the songwriting, and every, every single thing they have to do with uh, music and youth. We have so many children and students in the university that are going into music and what have you. And so I don't think it's only appropriate, really. The, 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 the popularization of Western music is, is long. It's been almost 20 years now that it's been ongoing. So I, I'm not sure we can really zero it on uh, Afrobeat. Um, I don't know if I answered that really correctly. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, th thank you for that. Um, well, before I go to <laughs> Vera, who uh, um, ask questions also for some of the panelists, I would like Odiri Aboni to, um, to ask the next question. Thank you. I don't know if I'm audible. Yes, you are. Oh, great. Um, I want to say well done um, to the presenters. I particularly, I was um, really impressed um, at Jessica's um, approach. She just used two slides. So she used two slides and that made it quite rich because, yeah, she spoke to the slides and Ah, I've never seen that before. So well done. I, we, I think uh, that's a beautiful engagement. Same for Luke Coyotes. I love the way the, he, he spoke. You used the urban culture to bring out the, at least the perspectives as it were in those um, um, polar questions. This was wonderful. I didn't see it coming from that point. I've been interested in the urban culture, youth culture and I've examined that at some time. So, well, I would say that at least for the background um, to enrich the paper, you could do a bit more on the literature, on the urban culture in different places. We have them around the West in African, um, in West Africa. Uh, there's a, I, I can't remember the book now, but there's African urban um, youth culture that would um, help give you insight into how it pans out. Basically, I say this because it's important for us to know what are those characteristics of the urban youth, the culture, the language. That will now help us to see how these play out in those artistic impressions that um, you analyze. Now, now to Tunde Decker, that's the one that interests me the most. I got in when the presentation had started. So please, out um, of curiosity, if I miss that, I'm curious about what the methodology um, you adopted for the study and the theoretical approach that you adopted because in your presentation, yes, it was rich, but in the course of the analysis, I, I couldn't tell whether it was linguistic, it was sociological, ethnographic or something. So Can you if, if you clarify that, that would be great. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, you are. Uh, quickly, quickly. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I've always been fascinated by phenomenology, and um, that's what I um, use because that that you know, that tells us that uh, the life you live, you see you see society from your own perspective, and that you you project what you what you what you live. How you see things is different from how I see things. You know, you know, music is, a, is an expression of, uh, or is, is a very an expression for youths. You know, it's an opportunity for youths to really say what they want to say. You know, the way you see life, the way you live life, it's quite different from the way I see life. And I guess so I'm, I've, I've always been fascinated by that, and that's what I use actually. Thank, thank you, thank you. I, I would like uh, um, Vera to ask um, the last um, set of questions from um, Yale and Nina. Please. Thank you so much. Many, many thanks to all five speakers for really five brilliant presentations. It would be wonderful to continue to discuss everything. And I have many questions to all of you, but for time reasons, please allow me to uh, uh, ask the two to Nina and to Yael. And uh, to Nina, um, thank you so much for uh, the uh, this thought-provoking paper on water and heritage of water. And I was thinking of the the uh, question of rain with regard to Joburg, because I was thinking of Sarah Nuttall's 
uh, studies of Anamwali Serpels, the old draft and the role of rain in Zambia. And I was thinking, uh, since you said how Joburg is far away from the sea, but and 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 the question of, I was kind of thinking of the water that comes from above. And uh, um, yeah, thank you so much for your brilliant presentation, which brings up so many uh, uh, important points and particularly this question of the stuff of storage, I think is really so crucial. and. Of course, also because it touches upon the question of restitution. I mean, it's one also of the many, many uh, uh, necessary arguments uh, uh, th that so much actually of these objects uh, uh, um, is is kept in storage and it's not even visible. I, I was wondering, uh, could you say a little bit about the? I mean, of course, it's a huge topic, uh, uh, but still a, a few. Uh, thoughts about ways how to counter this and how to actually change also our modes of display and our exhibition practices to kind of read uh, get away from this masterpiece discourse and uh, really kind of uh, see the potential of, of, of putting the materiality of everyday life uh, into the forefront. Again, please. thank you so much to all my speakers. <laughs> many, many. Yeah, 20, 20 seconds, please. And you can continue by the email. <laughs> Okay. Oh, well, um, maybe I'm going to let um, um, Dr. Babalala um, uh, close um, this um, session for us today and let us know what we are for tomorrow. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Larry, for um, sharing this panel. And, uh... oh, well, sadly, I think um, the network is crappy. Can, is it, am I the only one experiencing this? Yeah, okay. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So, uh, um, um, Vera, you want to? Vera, you want to? You want to say anything to close to close it for the, for today? Is there a possibility for Yael and Nina to briefly respond or no? Do you think we're above time? No. Yeah. Yeah, we're out of time. Uh, um, um, Dr. Bolala, your your internet, I think, was crappy the other time. So. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um. Yes, I was just going to say that uh, thank everybody for being part of this uh, panel. You know, we have uh, five sessions, and tomorrow we have the last two sessions in the panel. In the uh, the first one is uh, one in the in the afternoon, and the second one is going to be five p.m. in the uh, late afternoon. Please join us again as we continue on this journey of materiality of everyday life in Africa. We so much appreciate you, and we enjoy all the papers. You know, presented in this uh, session for today. Thank you, and we look forward to having you tomorrow. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you, and have a wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>